Anyway, lean back, tighten the seat belts, or the, yeah, not the seat belts probably. Um, we are going to tell you about developments uh, on this side of the ocean and on the other side of the ocean. So let's go on without any further ado. Marquis, uh, Marquis is a partner in, in White & Case. Um, he is probably uh, one of the most well-known competition lawyers in, in Brussels. He's done some very, very seminal cases, uh, most lastly uh, Google Android, uh, but also Google Shopping and Amazon uh, Buy Box, and I could go on and on and on. Um, he's going to talk about some of those, uh, which means that we will get a first seat view of uh, developments in EU law. Over to you, Marquis. Thank you. Um, well, I uh, have put together a presentation of some um, of the most important, at least, cases over the last uh, 12 months, more or less. Um, these mostly are case, uh, I mean, judgments from uh, the European courts, but there are some other uh, minor developments also at the Commission. Um, uh, which uh, I will talk about, but let's start first with the judgments. I will mention where I have been involved in order to, uh, you know, so that uh, you know where my biases are. Um, so first of all, cartels, what do we have new in cartels and Article 101? We don't have a lot of cartel decisions by the European Commission these days. Everybody in Brussels uh, is complaining about not enough cartel work in terms of the law firms. I'm sure more or less the same uh, happens um, uh, in uh, the member states. Uh, why is that? I don't know. I mean, maybe because of the follow-on claims, uh, maybe because there are not enough cartels around, maybe, you know, we have become uh, entirely compliant. I don't know. I guess not, but I think probably a combination of private actions and criminal enforcement that have made it much more difficult these days to um, use the leniency uh, notice and uh, go in. In any event, I mean, we do have some cartel cases in, um, before the European courts. Uh, one particular issue that uh, has arisen over the last few years is um, in Europe we have what we call a staggered hybrid cartel settlement cases sometimes. So essentially you have um, a cartel settlement, uh, um, you have the uh, settling parties and the non-settling parties. So essentially you have two kinds of decisions. First comes uh, the short decision, the settlement decision, and then a couple of years later comes the full Monty, essentially, which is the, the decision for the non-settling ones. And the issue is the second decision, sorry, the first decision may already refer to evidence uh, which implicates the addressees of the second decision. And therefore, the question is what about my, um, you know, in dubio pro reo rights, essentially. Um, so the, there has been, there, there was some fear in the commission that, oh my God, you know, there's new case law now that will not allow us to go through that procedure. But essentially the last case, Pometon, for example, which was uh, closely uh, looked um, by the European Commission and the, there was a, some nervousness, but in the end nothing happened. The court said uh, that um, uh, there is no problem. And essentially the fine was a bit, uh, uh, reduced, but um, uh, that was not the case. Now, my guess is that we will not see a lot of hybrid cartel, uh, staggered uh, cartel settlements. As I know from the legal service that they are particularly uh, opposed to them because they create issues. They have, the commission has to be very careful when uh, drafting the first decision, so we'll, we will see less and less of those cases. Um, that's not really a public enforcement case, it's a private enforcement case, Sumal. A lot has been said about this case. Um, I think it was the full court, if I remember well, um, with the president of the court, um, Lennartz, and Val, Judge Val, Val was also part of the, of the chamber. So here essentially it's about the single economic unit doctrine. I mean, we know that um, it works upwards from the subsidiaries to the parent undertaking. The question is whether can it work also downwards. And this was a private enforcement case in uh, uh, Spain. So the court said first, yes, it can, words, it, it can work downwards. So essentially, you have the cartel 
member, the cartelist, who is the parent undertaking, you can go anywhere in Europe in the, in the subsidiaries, essentially, and bring your claims. As long as some conditions are there, first condition is you need to have economic organization and legal links, that we knew. The second is quite new. There has to be a specific link between the economic activity of the subsidiary and the subject matter of the infringement, uh, essentially, decision. So the, the two have to be in the same, more or less, market. They must be doing the same thing. Otherwise, you can't catch, for example, a conglomerate, uh, a conglomerate parent undertaking uh, um, or essentially you cannot use, let's say, um, a, a subsidiary, you, can, you cannot go through the subsidiary against a conglomerate undertaking uh, if the decision was about one market and the subsidiary is some, doing something completely different. So that's interesting and maybe, and also actually the court said that you may have conglomerates which are active in several economic fields and in reality, you may have different economic units in the conglomerates. That's a bit strange, though, because usually conglomerates in the merger control, it's one single undertaking. It seems, to, does, it, does the court mean that, mm, you know, in antitrust things are different? But this is quite interesting, an interesting point. So it remains to be seen whether this specific link will be extended to public enforcement in um, uh, commission decisions. But the big... Um, the main developments have been in the unilateral conduct area. Now, we all know Intel, that's the foundational case, 2017, the ECJ, the Grand Chamber, you know, the, the big shift uh, in the case law. Uh, I was at a recent uh, conference uh, where the president of the Court of Justice said, well, we said, you know, it, uh, my, the, we said in the, in, in the judgment that the court has to be clarified, um, but in reality, we have actually developed the case law. That's what the court, uh, the president of the court said. And uh, since then, we know that um, there has to be an effects-based approach. Uh, that particular case was about exclusive dealing and exclusivity rebates. Um, and um, that the test in that case um, is essentially paragraph 20 of the guidance paper of the European Commission. So the court has taken paragraph 20 of the guidance paper and you have it there as paragraph 139 of Intel. These are the specific parameters that the, the uh, national competition authorities and the commission have to, um, have to assess in each particular case. This is the all circumstances test, the effects-based approach. Now, in January this year, we have the Intel case, the renvoi judgment before the general court. That's a very interesting case. Obviously, the court leaves aside naked restrictions. These are not affected by the Court of Justice's um, judgment and goes straight to the application of the principles that we saw before to the particular facts of the case. So the court says, forget about presumptions, etc. Yes, there is theoretically a presumption, but certainly if the dominant company comes forward with evidence, then in reality the commission or the authority has to listen to that evidence. And I ask you, do you know of any dominant company that will sit still and not submit evidence? So that's why, in my view, there is no presumption. I mean, that's just a legalistic, at the end of the day, way to say we're not really changing the case law, but they are changing the case law. So the court says, you need to conduct an effects analysis, forget about per se rules, etc. And actually, th this is where the general court goes even further. It says, the effects analysis, what does it mean? It means that as a minimum, this is not something that the Court of Justice has said. The, the general court says, as a minimum, you need to go through these five parameters that we mentioned before, paragraph 139 of Intel. And with regard to the as efficient competitor test, you did the test here. The test is one of the factors that must be taken into account. Um, also um, by the court when reviewing the commission decision. And what happened with regard to the test? That we know uh, the court starts from the presumption of innocence. Uh, it says every doubt has to benefit the defendant. The commission must produce sufficiently precise and consistent evidence 
to support the firm conviction that the alleged infringement took place. In Android last week, the court uses a similar word, says when you do the IEC test, it has to be done rigorously. So that is more or less the same thing. There were some errors here. I'm not going to go through them. We don't have a lot of time. So um, the, the court, one, one thing is for sure, if you read, I mean, there's a lot of paragraphs that are dedicated by the general court to the, speci to the, to the AC test. I mean, it shows you how the court really went into the last detail of the economic test uh, run by the European Commission. Qualcomm, another dramatic case. That's uh, June this year. Here, essentially, we had three elements. In reality, we had two elements, procedure and a little bit of substance. First, sloppy access to the file. It's uh, really, uh, I mean, surprising. If you read the court judgment, it's surprising how many mistakes, errors were made by the commission when it comes to procedure. And actually, the commission itself, it's in the judgment, I mean, read the judgment, the, you will see many times the court referring to the commission's responses to the court's questions when the commission says, regrettably, we did this, regrettably, we did that, etc. So they are uh, specifically, um, you know, admitting that there was, there were many issues with regard to the file. I know nothing about th this particular case. I'm not involved, but um, it seems that their lawyers felt very strongly that they didn't, they were not treated uh, uh, well by the commission. So um, another point which is interesting is that there was a breach of the right to be heard because when Intel submitted an econometric analysis, it had taken into account a specific theory of harm as developed by the commission. Then the commission slightly tweaked the uh, econometric analysis afterwards, but did not, in the decision, but did not give the opportunity to uh, Qualcomm to tweak its as efficient competitor test or something similar, the econo economic analysis that uh, Qualcomm had prepared. And therefore, um, the, it was a test done for a different um, type of uh, facts uh, than you had in the decision. And the court said, you can't do that. I mean, you should have given the opportunity to Qualcomm to be heard. On the substance, for me, the most important element is the counterfactual analysis. The court says, I'm not really persuaded that in a counterfactual world, uh, Apple would not have bought from Qualcomm, irrespective of the uh, rebates, which in this case were huge uh, in the area of 4 billion US dollars or something. Then you ask, okay, then why did they give the money? We'll come to that. Um, so the court said, in any event, most, the most likely scenario is that they would again have gone to uh, Qualcomm because there were technical issues with regard to the competitor's products. They, by the way, the competitor here was Intel. So <laughs> um, it's a small world. So that is quite interesting also, the fact that they go into the, the counterfaction. They say the fact that they went to Qualcomm and bought from Qualcomm Apple was the result of competition on the merits. This is the counterfactual, and therefore, you know, it would have happened anyway. They would have gone there anyway. So there was no competition uh, to be restricted in the first place. That's the interesting part of, the, of uh, Qualcomm. Google Android, uh, the biggest fine ever. I'm involved. Eh? I represented Google here. Um, the biggest fine ever in uh, EU competition law history commission because there is... Um, pardon me, the crazy fine imposed by the Polish Competition Authority against Gazprom, which was, uh, I think, more than 4 billion euros. But that, that was a bit of a political case, we can say. <laughs> Whereas this is a real thing. So, um, there were three issues at stake. Specific agreements that uh, um, OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, uh, and MNOs had to sign, or um, mostly the OEMs, but uh, in some cases the, the MNOs, they, they had to sign with um, Google in order to be licensed. These were the mobile application distribution agreements. This is the theory of tying. You uh, tie uh, Google Search and Chrome with Play, the Play Store. You had also anti-fragmentation agreements preventing manufacturers of uh, Android forks, essentially, prevent, preventing manufacturers from selling 
um, devices with uh, non-compatible, as Google said, Android forks. That was considered to be tying. And revenue sharing agreements, uh, which is an essentially an exclusivity rebate, exclusivity payment type of uh, theory of harm. What happened here? Mandas, when they got to the first, the tying, the issue was that one of the conditions for the licensing was that the OEM had to pre-install the Google search app in reality. That was, that was the main issue. And Chrome, but in reality, the, the main issue was the Google search app. They had to pre-install it. Careful, this is not about exclusive pre-installation. This is not about default status. It's just the search app to be there. And in reality, what the mothers did, in reality, the mothers essentially aimed at a, avoiding the scenario where essentially Microsoft would uh, sign an exclusivity deal with an OEM and would kick the search app out, essentially, would kick Google out of its system that Google itself developed. And eh? let's not forget, it's, it, Google is licensed, I mean, this is for free, Android is for free, right? So that was, that's, that's also the, the, uh, the story that uh, um, Google told the court. The commission said, that's not how we see it. Pre-installation, says the commission, is a significant competitive advantage because of the status quo bias. The court entirely um, agreed with the commission. You read that part, and it's actually very harsh uh, against Google. I mean, it's, uh, the court has agreed entirely with the European Commission on that point. It says pre-installation defaults the same thing. Google was saying, oh, it's not the same thing. You're just uh, confusing the two. It's the same thing, says the court. More or less, it's the same thing. The competitive advantage of the status quo bias could not be offset by competitors. I have a specific paragraph here, which, which is particularly harsh against Google. All this is just theoretical, what you say, says the court. I mean, the, real, the reality was that um, the pre-installation conditions uh, uh, had an effect. Um, and then, interestingly, Google could use other business models, says the court, including licensing fees for its Play Store. Okay. With regard to the AFAs, they are, all the arguments of Google are rejected, I would say, rather uh, quickly by the courts. The court says, yeah, I can see what you've done here, not persuaded by your objective justification. It is clear that this particular agreement has created foreclosure because you have foreclosed forks. So, very easy. The only part of the decision that was annulled was the third or the fourth abuse, which is about the revenue share agreement and exclusivity. Here, in my view, now with Android, we have essentially a trilogy of cases, Intel, Qualcomm, Google Android, which uh, apply the criteria of uh, Intel, the 2017 case, uh, and uh, are quite uh, uh, I would say, I mean, they, they engage in a lot of detailed assessment of how the commission dealt with a particular case. In this case, um, the incremental development of the case law, if you want, is the fact that for the first time we have a judgment which tell us how much coverage is not enough for an Article 102 case to be brought. The court says below 5%, that's not enough. This coverage is not enough. And in fact, there is a specific paragraph which says that even 10 to 20% would not be enough. That's the new thing. That's how the, the case law is developed. And of course, there was serious mistakes in the insufficient competitor test. That's accor that according to the court. I'm not going to get you through that. I mean, there was not, uh, this was not rigorous enough. And plus, there's a procedural error. The commission made some changes in its um, insufficient competitor analysis, but did not give the opportunity to Google to defend that at a hearing. Uh, it instead sent a letter of facts instead of a supplementary statement of objections. There was no hearing, and the court thought that this was serious enough. The fine was reduced only by 5%. Um, this is something that uh, I invite you to explain for yourselves when you read the, the particular part on the fine. Um, I think it's between the lines, but you will see there that in, in reality the court has increased the fine before decreasing it. 
So, you know, you'll have to read those paragraphs. It's, they're not saying it, but that's what has happened. They increased it, and then they decreased when the annulment, um, because of the annulment. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna take one or, or two minutes. Um, other developments uh, worth mentioning, Slovak Telecom, ECJ judgment, this is about refusal to supply. Um, in that case, the commission, apart from other practices like margin squeeze, we had also constructive refusal to supply. The big question is, does Bronner apply to these types of cases, indispensability, et cetera? The Court of Justice makes a distinction, reads, on the one hand, it says Bronner is a foundational case, very important case, right? W whereas the Advocate General was, was saying, forget about it. It's a very exceptional case, very rare. I mean, don't, it's not really one of, uh, it's not something uh, important. The court says, no, it's important. Bronner is a foundational case. However, the court says, there is a distinction that we need to make between pure refusals to supply and essentially cases where the company is supplying, but there is a question about the terms of the supply. These are differences, the court. And the court also says in the regulatory context, indispensability does not need to be there because in the regulatory context, regulation has decided that there should be access. Lithuanian Railways, similar. Google Shopping, uh, and I'll stop here. Um, Google Shopping is, was decided uh, November uh, last year. Again, full disclosure, I'm involved on the side of Google for uh, an intervener. Um, that's not a pricing case. That's a behavioral case, as you see. And here, the I mean, I have some pluses and minus. I mean, this is um, a very interesting case. On the pluses, I would say the court accepts that leveraging as such is not always anti-competitive. It says leveraging is something neutral. It can be pro-competitive, it can be anti-competitive. That's good, because otherwise, if the court was, uh, was saying something different, then it would have been very difficult for dominant companies to expand in other markets. So leveraging as such is neutral. The general court also, if you read the judgment, it's clear that there's a focus on effects, on the causal link, et cetera. So that's good to see. I mean, that the court is taking that very seriously and is looking at the effects of the causal link. There are references to, to the Commission's guidance paper. And as an aside, this is not a pricing case, but we have a, 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 an obiter, let's say, where the court says there are sufficient competitors. That's warranted in pricing abuse cases. Now in Android, they have even gone further. They say it's a good test. It's something very useful in, in such cases. The negatives, in my view, are this. I among the negatives, I would count this reference to super dominance. Uh, first of all, there was, this was never um, debated in, in uh, the pleadings or the written pleadings or the oral uh, hearing. I mean, so it came out of the blue, this reference to super dominance, which changes the special responsibility increases the special responsibility of uh, uh, dominant undertakings. There is this airy principle of a general uh, principle of equality. Everybody has to be dealt with equally, which doesn't exist in one or two. This is out of the blue. Um, there's this nebulous test of abnormality. What is normal and abnormal? Okay, we can discuss about the no economic sense, etc. but it's quite nebulous. I mean, in terms of legal certainty, that's a bit problematic. Um, and, you know, if you change your conduct, uh, then mm, I s will see that suspiciously can create disincentives, I think, this particular uh, reasoning. In this case, the Bronner test is not, doesn't apply, doesn't need to be satisfied because you have active and passive refusals. It's a bit strange. I mean, active and passive refusals. What is an active and what is a passive refusal? And in any event, so says the court, in any event, it would have been satisfied here. There is indispensability, that's interesting. Now, I, the slides, no doubt, Paolo, I guess they will be available. Um, there are lots of other cases, the Servizio Elettrico Nazionale, I'm sorry, we're in Italy, but you know, I can't go through that. Very interesting, uh, Abdurke General's opinion. Sort of uh, schizophrenic uh, judgment by the Court of Justice. Uh, there are lots on the one hand. On the other hand, it's like having Advocate General's Cocotte and Val in one uh, piece. You know, it's a bit, uh, you know, <laughs> can't. Um, on the mergers, Illumina Grail, obviously, the big development of July. Uh, enforcement, 
the two judgments on NBC Needham, B Post, Nord Zucker, and um, then on the development, the DMA, the DSA, and the new guidelines um, for verticals and horizontals. I'll stop here, otherwise Bill will come after me. No, go on, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Marcus. If I could sit there so I can just look at the screen. Uh, next speaker is, is Bill Kovacic. Um, Bill is a, is a non-executive director of the UK CMA. Uh, he's the former commissioner and a former chair of the US uh, FTC. And uh, he's currently a professor in global competition law at the George Washington University. Um, Bill is gonna take us on a, on a pretty interesting uh, journey around the US landscape of what is left of it. Bill. Uh, it's a thrill for me to be here with uh, Morton and Makis today, and uh, I'm so grateful to Paolo for convening an event that reminds me why I wanted to be a competition lawyer 50 years ago. Uh, um, I'm talking more about things that could happen rather than things that have. Uh, and to start, I wanna, wanna give you uh, some context for what is the most significant attempted realignment of the U.S. system since the late 1970s and early 1980s, uh, an effort to carry out what is truly a transformation of the U.S. system in basic ways. Uh, the context goes back two years ago. Joe Biden is having a hard time winning the nomination for his own party, and he strikes a bargain with two of his leading rivals, especially the person in the middle. He says, if you get out, I'll give you something. What would you like? And Elizabeth Warren said, I want to be the gatekeeper for regulatory agency appointments. He said, consider it done. And she's taken that up with a vengeance. That's uh, part of the product of it. That's the famous law firm now of Wu, Khan, and Cantor. Tim Wu in the White House, Lena Khan at the Federal Trade Commission, Jonathan Cantor at the Department of Justice, all blessed by Elizabeth Warren, bringing a dramatically different perspective to key leadership positions in the US system. Uh, this is about a year ago in July. That's Joe Biden. He's just signed his executive order on competition. The person who's taking the pen from him is Lena Khan. She is, I'd assert to you, the most famous person in competition law there is today around the world. You can go anywhere and they know her. There used to be another person. But I think uh, there was a day, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? The mirror said, it's not you anymore. And instead, it's then a 32-year-old person who's now the chair of the Federal Trade Commission. And there she is. By the way, uh, the FTC is an independent agency. I want you to look at the picture and see how much independence you see in that photograph. Joe Biden uh, lays out what he considers to be an important new agenda. Uh, this is known as the, in the U.S. as the 40 years of failure speech. 40 years ago, we chose the wrong path, in my view, following the misguided philosophy of people like Robert Bork, hiss, and pulled back on enforcing laws to promote competition. We are now 40 years into the experiment of letting giant corporations accumulating more and more power. I believe the experiment failed. And he has thrown his voice and his program decisively behind pro-competition policy, not just at the public antitrust agencies, but throughout the government. And what you have in his executive order is the formation of a new machinery to enlist all of the tools of government to promote competition, uh, 30, 72 specific prescriptions, along with directions to the FTC and DOJ to step things up and to change their guidelines and increase enforcement dramatically and use all the tools they have. Uh, it's the most vocal effort by a US president to put his stamp on competition policy since Franklin Roosevelt in the late 1930s. The philosophy of what this new team wants to do is laid out in a report for which Lena Khan was the principal author for the House of Representatives Judiciary Subcommittee on Antitrust Law in October of 2020, Congress should restate the in original intent and broad goals of the antitrust laws by clarifying that they are designed to protect not just consumers, but also workers, entrepreneurs, independent businesses, open markets, a fair economy, and democratic ideals. A broad redefinition of the purpose of the antitrust laws. And the advocates of transformation say, we're not the radicals. The radicals are the people who hijacked our system, 
and pulled it away from this vision, we are conserva conservative restorationists. Basically to take an old painting that's basically been touched up and to bring it back to its original colors and original image. We are not the radicals, we are the conservatives. And an implication here when you look at that is that the door is open in the US for a variety of different policy considerations. Sustainability, why not? Why not use it as a justification in a number of different settings? The whole ESG agenda, bring it in. Indeed, Commissioner Slaughter, when she was the acting chair, before Lena Khan has made the chair, gave presentations on antitrust as anti-racism. And other values that the fan base, who's that? Those are the legislative advocates, that's the broader collection of advocacy groups that want to push the US system decisively in a new direction. The new leadership is very attentive to what they have to say. And that group is not solely focused on what's interesting for consumers by way of price, quality, and innovation. There's the opportunity here for a broad redirection of US policy that pulls in a host of different policy values. That's a call for one of those policy values right now coming in. We have a call-in show here. People can call in and let us know what they want it to do. Uh, the methodology for trading off different considerations hasn't been laid out. That's going to be the hard part. What's the exchange rate between giving one group more benefits, maybe at the expense of higher prices? Not defined yet. What have they done to date? A lot. This is a fairly incredible accomplishment. First, they got the power. Who knew? If you'd taken a bet five years ago that those three people would be where they are now, most betting parlors would not have taken their bet. They would have said, we're for-profit enterprises, but it's not fair to take a bet where the better could never win. Keep your money, do something else. But it happened. They fundamentally changed the policy debate, I would say, here and abroad. When you talk to young people in PhD programs elsewhere, who do they know? It's Lena Khan. It's that you don't have to wait until you're 50 years old to have a mark on the system. And you want to bring new ideas into the process, you do it. Don't wait, be bold, be innovative. It's a new spirit they brought to the entire field, a level of vitality that hasn't been seen in a long period of time. They've put defenders of the mainstream perspectives on consumers, the traditional perspectives one associates with US policy on the back foot. And those who are defenders of that system, the establishment still doesn't know what hit them. And last, they've given real energy to the policy reform proposals in Congress that are one element of the possibility for policy change. And what's going on here is more than just a change in ideas. There is a true generational change here. Uh, Lena's 33. The old people in her majority at the FTC, Rebecca Slaughter and Alvaro Bedoya, they're, they're, they're 40. They're the old folks. Uh, this is a new generation. This is not old guys like me or a bunch of others in my cohort. This is a new group, new perspective, fresh view, and a decidedly different approach to how power should be used and exercised. And when you see the group, there's the chair. There's Rebecca, there's Alvaro. What do you see? Not a bit of gray hair. These are people, these are people from a different generation with a different set of expectations. It is a fundamental change in perspective. There are four reform streams that are being discussed now in the US. New legislation, take existing law enforcement tools and use them more boldly. Use soft power instruments like writing guidelines and administrative rulemaking. And the question is, what's the agenda? Will it stick? Legislation. There's a remarkable enabling environment here where the hard left and the hard right have converged on one thing, and that's that tech is the bad guy, and big tech in particular, for completely different reasons. But if you're one of the famous four and maybe that fifth, look out. A decade ago, you were rock stars. You'd go to a congressional hearing, and they'd ask you tough questions like, Gee, Mark, how did you get to be so wonderful? Or Jeff, can you be any more perfect than you already are? That's enough of the questions. Let's have some photos. And they'd run down to get the pictures. At the hearing that took place in the summer of 2020, they were treated like pariahs. The first question to Mr. Pinchai was, why are you still stealing? Now, you don't have to be familiar with US legislative hearings to know that that's a hostile question. 
and it went down from there. From geniuses, people talked about Zuckerberg running for president with a degree of seriousness. Now they're talking about putting him in jail. Uh, a dramatic change right and left together. The hard question is, does this go beyond tech to a broader reformulation of competition law? That's far less certain. What is the scope of the Venn diagram that overlaps, but tech's right in the bullseye? And they don't have a lot of friends in town now. They're spending a lot of money. I'm not sure they're spending it well. I think they do better standing at the crossroads of a major intersection, just throwing $100 bills up in the air. Durability, this is the hard thing, is it going to stick? The elections coming up in November are important. The thing to watch is if either chamber in the US Congress flips to the Republicans. If they do, they will probably be hauling, because not all of them like the new law firm that I showed you before. They will be hauling them up to testify every other week or so. They can make their lives awful by doing investigations and hearings, and the fun of having that job disappears right away. And the idea of going back to teach looks really good if that's what's going on. That's a big determinant of how far this goes. That's right around the corner, barely two months away. What are the legislative possibilities? Well, this is a list of everything Congress has been talking about for two years. Talking. Merger, fee, merger Filing Fee Modernization Act. Give the agencies more money. Let them keep the fees. American Online Innovation and Choice Act. That's the US variant of the DMA, borrowing a lot from DMA concepts. Open App Markets Act, State Antitrust Enforcement Venue Act, Foreign Merger Subsidies Disclosure Act, plus a broad retooling of antitrust standards across the board, and the possibility that we get a new omnibus privacy regime to supplement our national program, which is called the GDPR, and the state of California. So this is all on the agenda. I thought I'd have another sli slide that said enacted with a blank. But that's just a smart mouth way of doing it. None of it's been adopted. And the strong likelihood is now is that none of it's going to be adopted this year. So we go out of 2002 into 2023, and we wonder, is this interesting right-left coalition durable? Will they continue to want to take at least one big punch at tech, and then maybe do a few other things at the margin? I don't think they can get out of town ultimately without doing that, because they have talked so loud, so long about doing something. And there comes a point where unfulfilled promises become a source of ridicule. And they can stand a lot of ridicule. I don't know if they want to keep putting up with that. So something on that list goes ahead, perhaps. There's an awareness that the longer that the second item on the line is not enacted, that the DMA, in effect, will become the US policy. And Europe will have done for tech and platforms what they did for privacy. That is, it will be inevitable they seep into the US system and Brussels becomes, in effect, the legislature and regulator for the United States, along with California getting in when they feel like it. State governments, member states. New York is thinking of adopting an abuse of dominance provision, which comes directly out of TFEU Article 102. It's a direct import. Data protection and privacy, California, state of Virginia wanting to do more. What's holding up omnibus privacy legislation in the United States is that the state of California says, you can adopt whatever we want, but we want to go to beyond that whenever we feel like it. That is, go ahead and set the floor, but the ceiling is unlimited, and we're going to seek the ceiling out on our own, which blows up the possibility that you have some uniformity, predictability across the whole country. You wouldn't let your member states do that although they're gonna to try to do that with DMA, aren't they? If you give them truth serum, what are they thinking about? You know as well as I do. Uh, what about cases that are already going on? Well, there are three monopolization cases running against Google, two against Facebook, two state cases against Amazon, and how many of these has the Biden administration brought? That's zero. How many monopolization cases has the Biden administration initiated so far? Zero. How much talking have Biden administration officials done about how rough and tough they're going to be? A lot. But in life, I think we tend to be much more interested in what people do rather than what they say they're going to do. You can't build a reputation based on what you say you're going to do. At some point, you have to go out and do it. And the interesting question here is, when will they deliver? I think it's inevitable that the FTC will start a case against Amazon. 
I'm willing to bet you a single espresso, everybody in the room, maybe a double, and the Department of Justice is likely to start another Google case and maybe one against Apple. Because if they don't do it, again, this tidal wave of expectations where you've told the whole world, we're doing it, but then not just yet. Oh, it's hard, it's difficult. Wait a minute. Those timid guys like me before said it's hard and difficult. And they're the ones we have gloriously thrown out into the street. So you can't get away by saying it's hard and difficult. You've got to deliver. They'll have to do that. But they haven't done it yet. Mergers. What Jonathan Cantor and Lena Kahn bring to their jobs is an acute skepticism about mergers. I think their general view is that the typical merger is rubbish. It never delivers on its promises. Who gets rich? It's the advisors on the outside. It's the lawyers, the economic consultants, and their fellow bandits in academia. It's a racket, a perpetual motion machine that makes everybody rich except the people who buy the goods and services from the companies. They're the ones who suffer. So they start from the point of view, and this is a question they ask. I think it's a good question to go to practitioners in M&A. Name three deals, just three, that delivered on the promises that you made to the regulators. Just give me three of the greatest hits, and let's talk about those. My friends sort of fumble around and say, let's have a cup of coffee. Uh, and severe doubts about whether any big tech deal involving the top four makes any sense at all. Their view is that that's where US competition policy failed grievously to let it happen, and we're not going to do it again. Second request process. They're asking lots of questions about impact on labor markets, impact on total employment, impact on data issues, bringing in a variety of collateral policy concerns that were never front and center in the process. And yes, they're bringing cases, two categories. One category that stretches a bit, that's the Roundham House Books case not yet decided. It's the United Health case that DOJ lost in, within the past week. And there are cases where they're stretching a lot. That's meta within. It's a vertical case. It's a nascent acquisition. That's a really tough case on the edge. Uh, their view is we're going to bring a big portfolio of cases, and we are not afraid of losing. So in order to test the program, you get quicker results in merger review. They're going to bring a lot of cases at the boundaries. And Jonathan Kander has said, I'm going to keep bringing them. I'm not worried about losing. I'm going to fulfill the basic promise contained in the statutes and in the earlier jurisprudence. I am not afraid to be rebuked. Of course, the question you ask yourself is, how many do you have to win to remain credible? But the agenda is becoming more and more ambitious. We just don't have a lot of data points yet to know how they're doing. Basic reassessment of settlements. Uh, um, you know, you've heard Olivier talk many times about remedies, getting tougher on remedies. The view emerging from the US agencies, FTC and DOJ, is that settlements are generally rubbish. They don't work, even divestitures. So you got two choices. You block them or you let them go. And more and more, they're willing to go to court and say, we want to block. A case filed last Wednesday, this is the Asso Lloyd case, that's a Swedish case that makes hardware products. The parties came in and offered a deal, and they say, ah, acknowledging harm that their proposed transaction would cause to competition, the defendants have offered to sell off specific portions of their globally integrated business. Your settlement offer proves that you know it's a bad deal. And your solutions are no good. Uh, if you gave true serum to the US leadership when they look at Brussels, I'd say, you guys take cheap deals. And cargo tech's a good example. You want hopelessly complicated divestitures, some of these, some of those. And if you were to have an unvarnished translation of what DOJ has to say, which is, your deal doesn't work. That's why we blocked it. And essentially, they're saying both is, we want to wring settlements out of this process. You've got to be willing to go to court, which means, how many cases are they going to bring? And are judges going to get more and more involved in the process of deciding whether the settlement offer is adequate? That's what happened in United Health, which DOJ lost. And the court said, their offer looked pretty good to me. I don't know why DOJ didn't take it. Are we going to be litigating the settlement proposals in the courtroom instead of negotiating them in the agencies? But the agencies think settlements generally fail. So why bother? Better to block. What's to come? Jonathan Kander has said, I want to start bringing criminal Sherman Act monopolization cases. 
which means going to a place like Google and saying, are you Mr. Pinchai? Yes, put your arms out. Thank you. Click. Like that. No joke about it. Individual criminal responsibility for Section 2 violations. Hasn't done that yet. That gets people's attention, though, when you talk about it. They're willing to do it. Against whom? A big fish or a minnow? Enforcement of the FTC Section 5 authority to reach unfair methods of competition. Uh, maybe to attack the exploitation of bargaining asymmetries that don't get picked up in conventional U.S. antitrust law. That's seen as the expansion joint. There's probably going to be a reformulation of the FTC's policy statement. Talking about it, or are you going to do it? How many cases are you going to bring to do it? But I think they have to do it because they've talked a lot about it. Uh, soft power tools. There's a pending revision of the merger guidelines. What do Khan and Cantor believe? Those guidelines should go back to their strict structural presumption standards, and we get rid of so much of the economic mumbo jumbo that made merger review far more difficult and costly and got us nowhere closer to getting a better result. The problem is, how far can you lead the courts by throwing all that out? Because the courts have liked it. And the FTC's revision of its guidelines saying how far they're going to go with unfair methods of competition, which is potentially quite elastic. New merger guidelines draft later this year in place with a final draft, final version, 2023. Notice that's a long time off. This should have been done already. The Biden administration screwed up by taking so long and getting this in motion. They were basically eight or nine months behind the point at which they should have been, and those are precious months you never get back. Rulemaking, the FTC's talked about using its prescriptive rulemaking capacity to adopt new competition rules. Problem, there are big doubts about whether Congress, whether the court will agree that the FTC has that authority. So they're going to ride a big truck over a frail bridge. The only way to fix this is for Congress to say, yes, you have the authority. Can you carry it out? Well, some global implications, uh, finally. Um, you know, I'll, I'll get my space. Yeah, yeah. Implementation. They want to do a policy moonshot here. This is a moonshot to put policy in an entirely different place, on another celestial body. The physics of going to the moon were pretty straightforward. The engineering of sending human beings there safely and bringing them back, ah, that was really hard. That's policy implementation. And what gets in the way of that? Are you going to have political support long enough? One, are you going to have enough time to do this? How many elections are you going to win? And how many presidents are going to pick people like you to keep doing this? Three, the expectations are sky high. You said the other people were cowards or worse. Now you've got to do anything they want. Can you do it all when they say, fix inflation, bring petrol and food prices down? Yes, sir, right away, sir. Can I get you anything else? Not enough resources or legal authority to do this, and a skeptical judiciary that doesn't believe that this new direction is appropriate. And if Congress doesn't come to the rescue with the new legislation, you're going to have to do it through the courts. That's going to be a tough ride. And how long are you going to have the power to stay at it? For the globe, what's the message to the US to the rest of the world going to be? We will never tell you to slow down again. We will never tell you not to do something. We are not going to be a voice of caution. We're going to say, do whatever you want, just do a lot of it. Off the brake, on the accelerator. You're never going to hear the cautionary tone from the US in this era. Uh, what are they going to do to merger guidelines, which have been influential around the world? Are they going to really change the vocabulary and methodology to cause people to go back and say, hmm, we bought that off the rack or adapted it? Going to change it? And a much greater view that we have to pick out the most aggressive enforcers in the world and join the arms with them. It hasn't all happened yet, but I think they've got to do it. And a lot of the things on this list, they're going to try. Thanks. I told you to fasten your seat belts. <laughs> that was why. Um, I, I don't, we're way above, out, out of time. Do we have time for a question or two? Or, yeah? Anybody who, who dares to come after Bill? <laughs> oh, he wore you out. You actually, um, you actually answered my, my, my question to you, which is, um, who's winning? The Europe or the US? And uh, I think you've sort of 
I, I guess it, I, I'd answer it with a slight dodge. I saw a senior official from the competition director give a speech in Brussels a week and a half ago where he said, for a long time we stood alone in the world. A little bit of self-congratulation, just a bit. And then said, it's so heartening to see the US coming and joining us now. <laughs> I wanted to raise my hand and say, you don't really understand what's going on. They don't want to join you. They want to pass you up because your remedies aren't tough enough. Your vision of goals is too cramped. They want to displace that with a new framework. They want new laws. They want new authority. They're not coming to join you. So when that sports car goes sailing by you on the passing lane, blinking its lights, uh, it will have the initials LK, JK on it, TW. Wow. I don't know. American sports cars? Yeah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> Marcus, the DMA, you, you're very active in the tech field. Any particular thoughts on the, on the DMA and the interplay with competition rules? Um, the DMA is a competition, of course, tool itself, although the Commission disagrees, and, but in reality it is. The, DN, the DNA of the DMA is competition, right? I mean, that's clear. Now, it's different in the sense that uh, we have all these per se rules, uh, um, it's regulation, so it's ex ante. Now, the question is, how will the DMA be enforced? Um, I, I caution against this idea that um, the DMA is um, about enforcement, and therefore, you know, we should uh, have something like the GCR. How many fines did you impose this year, commission on the DMA? Ah, your fines were less than uh, whatever. I mean, that means that you're failing to enforce the DMA. That's not the idea. If we start thinking like that, this is the failure of the DMA. The DMA is not about cases to enforce it, non-compliance cases. The DMA, if we want to be successful, we shouldn't have any non-compliance case. Okay, there may be incidents and accidents, but the idea is not to have enforcement, but really for the company's consent to change their practices, adjust their practices to regulation, and then let the regulation be, and of course, the competition rules are always on the corner, in the corner. I mean, they can always intervene. But if we start thinking, oh, you know, you need uh, 500 um, employees and uh, serv civil servants to, because we have a problem with enforcement and how you'll, no, that's not the idea. That would be the proof that the DMA has failed. That we need to bear in mind. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, pull this one to a close. And a big round of applause for our speakers. Thank you.